Hey guys, I'm Matt Hernandez, and today I'm going to show you nine different standard lighting setups. Okay, so I've got my computer set up here. We're going to tether because we're in the studio. I've got an A7R5, and we are shooting with constant light. I debated whether or not to do this with strobes or constant light, but I thought that it might be beneficial for you guys to see me move the light as I explain the setup, so that's why we went with the constant lights. Right now we have two 1x4 strips at 45 degrees on each side behind, and then a Manny Ortiz beauty dish um, in front with, I think, silver interior and the diffusion. So that's a standard like sports type setup. That's, that's one of the ones that I'm gonna go over later. Right now we're gonna talk about one and two light setups. This would be three, obviously. So the first one, we're gonna work from the back up, which is what I always teach my students at workshops because you wanna get your background set first, then you wanna get any edge or backlighting, and then you wanna get your main light. You wanna go in that order because it helps you get the exposure more, it helps you, it's easier to get the exposure correct when you do that. I also wanna introduce everybody to our model, Sasha. I've had, um, reservations about introducing her on YouTube for a while for obvious reasons. It's a little bit creepy, but I also do want to say as a side note that it's very beneficial to have a mannequin like this because it allows you to test things without having to have somebody just sit there for hours and not do anything. So, you know, it's good to have, be able to have models, but, and real models, there's something to be said for that too. But when you're just doing stuff like experimenting and you don't know like how in depth you're going to go, or if you're doing something kind of crazy and it may, it may or may not work, Sometimes it's better to have a mannequin just because it doesn't time is not as big of an issue I put a wig on her just because it made it a little bit less creepy And I thought it would help to have hair because most people are gonna have hair that you take pictures of too So you can still see the sides of the face where we've got highlights and the edge lights And so the first thing we're gonna do speaking of edge lights is we're gonna turn this main light off and then just have the backlights so you can see what backlighting looks like or edge lighting it could be called backlighting edge lighting or rim lighting so I'm at 150th of a second, f2.8, ISO 200. And that's a pretty slow shutter speed. Normally I wouldn't shoot with that if I was handheld, but we are in the studio, we are on a tripod. So it, for that, it would be fine. I would be very comfortable taking a headshot like this if I was on a tripod. If not, probably not. Okay, so there is an example of backlighting. The, the front's gonna be completely dark. We're just gonna have lit on the edge. That's why it's called edge lighting also. Now I'm gonna rotate our model and face them camera left just so you can see what it would look like if, if somebody turned and you got a profile of them. So all of these lighting scenarios are how the light relates to the face so keep that in mind and most of them have pretty intuitive names. There's a couple that I don't really know where they got the name from honestly but backlighting is pretty obvious that that one works that explains exactly what it is. Okay so let's take a profile of her. So this it, is a very dramatic shot, obviously. My good friend Dave Black always says, if you want something to be interesting, only light part of it. And that's definitely true in this situation. Now you wouldn't wanna probably do an entire portrait shoot like that because you can't really see the person, but it is good to throw these shots in from time to time as fillers just for a little bit extra so they get something a little bit more dramatic along with the regularly lit stuff too, which we're gonna to get to here in a minute. But that looks pretty cool, I think. I'm gonna turn, I'm gonna turn this the one on the camera right, I'm gonna turn that edge light off so you can see what it looks like with one light. Let's zoom in just a little bit because there's gonna be a lot of black space on camera right now because there's no light back there. And I'm shooting horizontal just to get more in the frame. But if I was doing, I'll actually shoot this with vertical because there's no need for that entire right side of the picture there. Now, if there was background interest, like if I, was, I had a city behind her or something like that, that would be totally different. We might want to keep that in there, but since it's just black, we don't want it to be the entire right side of the frame horizontal like that. So I'm going to zoom in. Okay. So again, that's really cool. Not a whole shoot, you know, like that probably, but, but for a couple, that's, that looks really neat. Okay. So now I'm going to show you an example. We're going to go from backlighting to short lighting. So short lighting is, is, is a technique that can be very flattering for women. You could light anybody like this and make them look slimmer. Um, so that's why it's really good for girls. You're only gonna light, you're gonna keep the light kind of in the same area. You're gonna move it a little bit. You're gonna have them turn towards it. So it's gonna light, it's, it's almost gonna be like an edge light, but you're gonna have a little bit more creep around on the other side where there's only shadow in, in backlighting. Okay, so you can see that I took our beauty dish. Now I could have used the strip box, but it's a little bit too thin for what I want here. So you can, you're gonna be able to see, let me take a shot real quick so you can you guys can look as I'm explaining it. Okay, so you can see that I've moved the light camera left and I use the beauty dish because it's a bigger light source. So 
The strip box is, is thin, so it's going to give off a thinner beam of light, obviously. And I want a little bit of right, a little bit of light on the camera right here on that side of her face, her left. So it's it's pretty much beside her, and I had her turned towards the light. So it's lighting the short side of her, which is why it's called short lighting. But you can see why this would have a slimming effect because it's still lighting her where it can be a portrait because you can see more of her than you can with backlighting. But it's also not lighting as much. So the part that's in shadow, you're not going to see as much. So anybody that's going to make them look a little bit thinner. So that's, 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 a, that's a flattering technique that you might want to use for somebody that might be a little bit bigger or if you want to just give that slimming effect to them. Okay, so now from here, we're going to go from short to broad lighting. So I'm gonna keep my model in the same place and just move the light to the opposite side. Okay, so now we've got broad lighting. So the reason it's called broad lighting is because it's lighting the broad side of the model, right? So as opposed to short, which is, there's not as much lit here and now there's more. So that's where the name comes from. And you can see where if somebody was, if somebody was a little bit overweight or a little bit heavier than, or you, or you had something maybe that you didn't want to accentuate in the shot, like you didn't want to call attention to it, then you can see where this might not be the lighting setup that you want to use because it's going to light more of them and they're turned away from the light. So everything that's brighter in a picture is going to be what you look at first. So you can see like why this would be a little bit more flattering than this, depending on the person too. You have to always take account your subject and what's going to fit them the best and that's why we're showing I'm showing that's why I'm showing you all these different lighting scenarios because there's not one scenario that's going to be perfect for every person it's not one size fits all it's everybody's going to photograph differently and so that's why you need to know different techniques you can use to make them look the best they can possibly look broad lighting is great for some people some people you're not going to want to use it on Okay, next we're going to move to split lighting, which is going to be directly to the side. And whereas when we used short lighting before, we were pretty much to the side and we had the model turned towards the light. Now I'm going to have them face me straight on. Okay, the reason that I'm doing that is because I want her face to be obviously lit so you can see the pattern of the light. But there's also something very specific that happens with split lighting. You can see it's called split because half of her fa face is in shadow and half of it is in the light. But when you use this technique, because you're directly to the side, you can get some weird shadows going on like in the eye socket right here, right by your nose. And it can be very, it can, it can really make wrinkles stand out a lot more. And it's honestly not really that flattering. So this is not my favorite lighting setup. I would only use it in very specific situations, but I, I don't remember very many times, honestly, that I've used it. It may be as an accident, but I usually, if I take this shot when I'm doing a portrait shoot, I usually move the light around to the front a little bit more and take another one just to be sure, because this, like I said, this is not my favorite. Let's take a shot so you can see that up close a little better. So in theory, I feel like that this, it sounds dramatic when you just explain what it is, but then when you actually do it, it usually doesn't end up the way, at least when I've done it, the way that I envision it, it doesn't work quite as well as I would hope because it sounds like it'd be really cool coming directly from one side, but with them facing straight on, honestly, it doesn't look that great. There are situations where you could use it to your advantage, but it's not something I would typically use. All right, so the next two we're going to go over are Loop and Rembrandt. They're pretty similar, so let's do Loop first. So you're going to be about 45 degrees right here, so the person, they can angle a little bit, obviously, but what you're going to do is get a loop from the nose. The, the shadow is going to make a loop down just like that, but you don't want it to connect to the cheek shadow. Okay, so let's take one like that where the shadow's not quite as big, and then I'm going to move it a little bit more camera right so it's a little bit more directional so now you can see the loop is just pretty much on her nostril there and then there it's getting it's starting to get down a little bit lower right so it's up to your discretion how dramatic you want that to look but that's where the name comes from so this is a pretty flattering setup it's pretty standard, just 45 degrees to the right. And then you don't want to go too directional, but you're going to get some shadow on the left side. So there's some interest there. And then, like I said, that the, the size of that shadow is, is up to you. Okay, so now I'm going to move the light up just a hair and back. And the idea here is you want that shadow from the nose to connect down to the shadow on the, on the other side of the shot, on the, in this case, camera left or her right. So I moved it up and I moved it back. So it's gonna be more, a more dramatic version of loop lighting. And 
it's not quite as flattering probably as split lighting because she's not turned towards the, the light. She's pr still straight on. So you're connecting that shadow from the nose down to the cheek. And this was named after the painter uh, Rembrandt. This is how he, this is the lighting pattern that he had in a lot of his paintings. That's where it came from. So I, because I moved the light back, I'm gonna have to change my exposure quite a bit. I was at ISO 200. I'm gonna go up to 640 now. So you can see also the background changed, and that's a side note too that you always need to pay attention to. So when you look at the loop lighting, you can see that it's lit a little bit, but the light's very close to the subject. When I move it back, that light's gonna spread out more, which is gonna light the background. It's also causing a shadow on that strip box. So while that's a light that we're gonna use later, in the studio, it still is going to be, even though it's not in the shot, it's still going to affect the shot because of where the light is placed. So you always have to be aware of everything in your shot, even in the background like that. Even if something's not in the picture, the shadow from it can still affect the way it looks. So I'm actually going to move that back just so you can see what it looks like. So this is, like I said, a little bit more dramatic. Um, it, I, wouldn't, I would use it in a portrait shoot, but I wouldn't use it exclusively. I would throw the other ones in that are a little bit more flattering. Depending on the subject, some people will be able to handle this type of lighting better than others, just like all of these. But the more dramatic stuff, you really got to watch who you're using it with. And then, you know, if somebody has bad skin or if they're older, then it's, gonna, it's really going to call that to attention because it's going to make their more deep shadows in their face. Okay, so now we've taken the light and moved it back to the center. So it's directly over the camera, angled down about 45 degrees. And this is called butterfly lighting. And I have no idea why. But this is gonna be, this is a pretty standard one that I use quite a bit. So it is gonna create shadows underneath the eye socket. So you have to be aware of that. It's gonna create shadows from the nose and the chin. So I had to adjust my, my camera back to ISO 200 where we were at before. Okay, so you can see what I was talking about. Now the, the, this mannequin doesn't have a very big nose, so there's not a ton of shadow, but there is a little bit underneath right there. And then you can see one downfall of having a mannequin and not a real person is that you don't see the catch lights. Um, so you, you have to be aware of that, unfortunately. But, but you can still, you always want there to be catch lights in the eyes. Well, I take that back. You don't always want to. Sometimes if you're trying to be super, super dramatic, it doesn't really matter. But catch lights give life to the eyes. So with clamshell, you have to be, you have to be conscious of the fact that you can lose the catch lights the higher you go and the more angled you go, which you're not gonna see that here, unfortunately but I'm gonna go higher so that you can see the shadow under the chin because that can also have a dramatic effect, especially if you're shooting the female because they may not like that big dark shadow where you start to lose their neck, depending on the shirt they have on too, because it could cover part of their neck. So you have to be aware of all this stuff whenever you're using it, but this, it can be a very flattering look if it's lower, but the higher you go, obviously the more dramatic it's gonna be. So let's take another shot now with it quite a bit higher. And while that looks cool and dramatic, it probably isn't gonna be as flattering. So that's the safe shot. Once I got that, I'd probably do the more dramatic one just so I had both. Okay, so now for here from Butterfly, we're gonna move to Clamshell, which is very similar and you can do it, but you're just gonna, basically you're gonna add in another light that's gonna mirror this light underneath. So you can do this a few different ways. I've got a 36 inch beauty dish, so I could use a 24 inch beauty dish below. I could actually use another 36. I could use a 24. I could also use two strip boxes, or I could use the beauty dish and a strip box, which is what I do a lot of times, because I, you can do this different ways. If you have them on the same power, then you have to be aware of the fact that it can really blow somebody's neck out, if they, especially if they have, like, have, a, have a long neck and it's exposed with the shirt they're wearing, or like they're, if they're maybe not very tan, like if they're a lighter complexion, their chest, because you're gonna angle the light, it's basically gonna be the exact same angle just coming from the bottom. So it can really brighten up this area. So I usually try to turn mine down and it's kind of at your discretion how, how bright that, that, it's basically a fill light from underneath. But this is more of beauty lighting because it's really gonna fill in all the shadows, all the wrinkles. So it's a good, it's a good look for headshots because especially if somebody might be, might be a little bit older and maybe they don't have a ton of wrinkles but they have a few and they're conscious of it, this is gonna fill those in and really make them look younger and make their skin look really good. And if, depending on the intensity of that light underneath, you can really make them look like they're glowing. And there's a, there's a limit to that, I feel like. You don't, I, I don't like to go at the same power. I used to make that mistake when I first started out, and I like it a lot better when it's more of a fill light. But, so let's get that set up real quick. Okay, so I moved in the one by four strip box underneath at the same angle, same distance. 
roughly at the same power so you can see what that looks like. Okay, so granted Sasha is made of plastic, she doesn't have real skin, but you can still see, like even without wrinkles, she looks like she's glowing kind of. And you can, so you can probably understand how that would, could be flattering for a human that is gonna have pores and skin and you know wrinkles in their skin and that kind of thing, blemishes. So, cause it fills in those shadows. So it looks cool on the surface, but then think about if this was a white shirt, like even like the logo and the, and the strings here, like they're really bright. And again, you notice the bright stuff in a picture first, right? So you don't want their neck to be super bright and distracting, especially if somebody's face complexion is different than their neck complexion. If this is maybe not as, as tan as their face, then that's gonna be really distracting. You don't, definitely don't want that. And you don't have to edit that either. So let's turn that down and I'll show you the difference, which I think looks better. So now we turn it down significantly and you can already see there's some shadow underneath her chin. To me, that's gonna look, still look really flattering, but not quite as nuclear as, as the other way when they're both the same power. So let's look at, there's butterfly lighting again with no fill. Now granted, that's a little bit underexposed because I did have the light up pretty high. Well, let's go to the, to the one before. Okay, so there's the, there's the first one before I moved it up. So basically it's the same thing, it's just got a fill light underneath. So to me, that's a, that's a really good way to light a headshot because it's gonna be, it, that's gonna look good on anybody. Now, it's not dramatic, but again, with a headshot, you probably don't want it to be dramatic. You want it to just be what the person looks like and you want it to look flattering. If it's a portrait shoot and you are going for drama, then maybe you don't use this setup specifically, but that's why I'm showing you all of these different scenarios because they're gonna have specific uses. Okay, so the last one is called cross lighting. So I'm basically just gonna put the lights across from each other. If you go back and look at my work on Instagram or Facebook or even on my website, you'll see that I use that a lot. I use, that, I use this lighting setup probably more than anything. And that's because I shoot a lot of athletes. It has a lot of benefits because it can cut out your subject from the background. So if, they're, if you're shooting underexposed and you're darkening everything, there's gonna be shadows and the background's gonna be darker then edge light has a huge benefit because that is gonna cut your subject out from the background. And then it also makes them look really cool because it's kind of like, almost like a 3D effect. It makes them look like they are, they're standing out more so that it makes sense that it makes it look like that. And you could add in two edge lights if you want to, but it's easier to move around with two lights. And that's why on portrait shoots a lot of times with like seniors and that kind of thing, or with athletes, I'll be moving around quite a bit. So two lights is easier to move around than three. That's why I usually use two. But you can also use that edge light as practical lighting, which means if there's a light source behind them, then that can mimic what that light source is. Like, let's say it's the sun and you've got an edge light with a gel on it, like an orange or yellow gel out of the frame, then that edge light's gonna look like it's the sun. Or if there's a stadium light behind them and you just got two lights at the normal temperature and the edge light's out of the frame, that's gonna mimic, and the stadium light's camera left, you've got the edge light camera left, that's gonna look like the stadium light is what's creating that edge light while it's, it's actually not but that's, that's a very good use of, of your second light to make it look like it's coming from the actual scene. So let's get that set up real quick. Okay, so you can see the lights are directly across from each other, hence the name cross lighting. This one is four or five o'clock, that one's 10 or 11, around that. You want them just the edge light just out of the frame. Don't make the mistake of leaving it in the frame and then trying to crop it or Photoshop it later if you can help it because you can get, now we're using constant light so there's not really any flare right now. But when you use strobes, you can get flare from that edge light. So especially if you don't have a grid on it. So, and then I have a video on grids too, if you want to check that out, we'll link that also. But so make sure that it's angled. You don't want to angle, angle directly at the camera. Obviously you want to angle it at the other light. So, and I've got this horizontal just so you can see what that edge light's going to do to her shoulder and side of her face and her neck. Okay. So we pretty much have loop lighting with and backlighting combined and actually you can see there is a little bit of flare on the, on the camera left here. You, I don't know if you can see it on YouTube or not on the video, but you'll be able to see it when we put the, the image up. So in that case, be aware of that. That's something that I don't want. It's not the end of the world, but I can fix it, so I'm going to. And all we have to do is move this light around a little bit so it's angled not quite as much at camera. And it was actually probably a little bit too much behind her anyway. It wasn't directly across from that other light. And I thought it was. Let's see if that took care of it. Yep, so you can see on the left here, there's the flare. So you lose contrast and it washes it out and now it's gone. Just by moving it just a little bit right there. 
So I think, again, I think this is a really cool effect. It gives a 3D look and that's why it's one of my favorites. It's really appropriate for athletes and dramatic shots, underexposed stuff, which is what I do a lot of times. So it can also be, it can also be great for hit shots too. So it doesn't have to just be used for dramatic athlete shots. All right, guys, that does it for this video. I hope everybody got something out of it. If you did, I'd appreciate a like, a subscribe. Make sure you hit the bell so you know when I post new content, there's gonna be a lot more to come. We'll see you next time.